Hello, this is the new 8th generation C8 Corvette Stingray and it is not yet officially available in the UK and this is not, as you may have noticed, sunny North America. Instead, you can get one through an importer in the UK called Clive Sutton. He does a lot of Mustangs and other American imports. But the question is, should you buy one? Well, I've brought along a Porsche 911 to compare it against to find out. But first, some details on the new C8 vet. Now you will know, I imagine, the fact that the front is quite short on this car, shorter than other Corvettes, is because the first time, for the first time in the car's 70 year history, the engine is not there, it is back here. It is a mid-engine supercar for the first time. Now there was a long time when GM's engineers said, look, Corvette traditionalists, they don't, they don't want to get rid of leaf springs even, but things have moved on. So there is an aluminium tub, an aluminium rear subframe, aluminium front subframe, double wishbone suspension all round with coil springs and on this car, Magneto Rheological Adaptive Dampers and the engine is in the middle. It's a 6.2 litre V8, it makes 495 brake horsepower in this trim at about 470 foot-pounds. It drives the rear wheels through an eight-speed twin-clutch transmission. There is no manual option. The new layout means that there is a boot at the back and there is another one at the front, but there are still just two seats inside. The roof comes off, even on this coupe, and slots rather neatly into this space back here. And in the United States, this car costs from less than $60,000, but that is not the whole story as we will come to in a minute. So first, why don't we take a look inside? All right, so welcome to the two seat cabin of the Corvette. And it is pretty plush in here, actually. There is a lot of stitched leather. It is quite well finished. I always feel that the Corvette and American cars in general are perhaps sort of half a generation behind the best stuff that Europe has to offer. But this is pretty nice and pretty well uh, stitched and feels well screwed together. Down here there's a big panel. All of this is basically heating and ventilation for driver and passenger and heated seats and so on and so forth. And then the rest of the cockpit is nice. I don't, I can't get quite as comfy as say in a 911. I can't sit quite as low. I can't get this slightly weird square steering wheel quite as far towards me, but it is a pretty business-like cabin. Now, when I said prices start from $60,000, one of the things to bear in mind is like a lot of cars, there are option packs. So there's two LT, which adds a few grand, three LT, which adds another few grand. And then this car has a Z51, Z51, I think performance pack, which A, gives it a five brake horsepower and pound foot increase, adds a limited slip differential. It adds some extra aero and a slightly louder exhaust too. So you start to add to the price, even in the States before you bring it to the UK. But this is a business-like cabin. I've got a full touch screen here, which basically has Apple CarPlay and is also very quick and responsive. A bunch of digital dials. It is a place, really, that you think, yeah, I could, I could go driving in this car. So uh, why don't we do that? And so to the Corvette to drive. It's a good noise, isn't it? Quite mechanical. And this new eight-speed dual-clutch transmission it's really quick, really smooth. Let's try it in full auto and see what that's like. Yeah, it's smooth. However, on circuit, you're better off taking control, unsurprisingly. So the driving position I can't get quite on with in the same way that I could get on with it in the 911. It's very quick to change direction. I mean, that's maybe not surprising for a mid-engined vehicle. There's not a lot of obvious understeer. This steering wheel is a slightly unusual shape, but as long as you keep your hands at a sort of normal quarter to three position, that's not a big deal. Oh, it makes a great noise. Revs to six and a half, soft limiter at six and a half, but it stops really nicely as well. You get loads back through the steering. I don't remember that from any previous Corvette. It's really accurate, quite quick. And it tells you loads about what's going on. And just as you brake, although it stops very well in a straight line, if you just keep the brakes trail towards the corner, it's very happy to try and involve the back in the cornering process and, and step out. That's really lovely, really nice. In a way, it's a little bit like something like a, oh, it's just really controllable as well. It's, a, it's not unlike something like a Ferrari F8 Tributo or one of those car's predecessors, in that it's mid-engined 
and has all the agility and everything that those cars have, but at the same time, really progressive when it lets go. Driving position reminds me a little bit of, let's say a Ford GT. The experience reminds me a little bit of a Ford GT. Maybe it's the sort of raw noise. This is a proper bit of kit. And in its home market, where you can buy a base one for less than a Porsche Cayman, it's a real bargain. Now, when it comes to the UK, it's not quite as straightforward. General Motors said it was going to sell this car in right-hand drive, announced pricing of something like 80 to 88,000 pounds, but has gone mysteriously quiet on it. And if it does arrive in right-hand drive, and when it does, if and when it does, it will be towards the end of next year, by which time, the game may well have changed, the price may well have changed, who knows? So if you want one, well, your options are to go to somewhere like Clive Sutton, who's applied this car, and pick one from them. And it will cost you more than the 60 grand in the United States. But then you might want to add the Z51 pack. I mean, it almost certainly do. Then you want to add another couple of, maybe the 3LT pack, plus another couple of options. It's quite easy in the States to take this car to like 80, $85,000. Then there's the local sales tax. Then you've got to import it into Europe, which will incur a 10% tax. Then you've got to bring it into the UK and pay VAT on top of your import duty, which will be 20%. And then you've got to put it through an IVA test to make sure that it is compliant with UK registration. By the time you've done all that, you can quite easily spend £95,000. And that's before the dealer has made any money on it. And understandably, they won't do that for nothing. So you can end up with a car that I've, I've been asked to insure for 130 grand in the UK. So it is 911 plus some options sort of money. Which brings us rather neatly to the other car that we have here, which is a Porsche 911. Let's go and have a drive, see how the two stack up against each other. Whichever way it goes, what I can tell you is that I really like this car. This car is really, really good, really good. It is the best Corvette I have ever driven. Okay, so that was the Corvette. And this is the 911, A911. It's a standard 911 two-wheel drive with not that many options. It's a really nice spec, actually. It also happens to be my editor's company car, so I should not crash it. So as 911s do, it has a rear-mounted flat-six engine, turbocharged, of three litres. And not quite as much power as the Corvette, but what with the turbocharger and what with it being a little bit lighter than what it was, it's a really good road car. It's also a surprisingly spectacular track car. Sometimes on the road, it feels so refined that it's almost like a Mercedes SL, if you like, but you get so much back through the steering and everything is really linear. You know, if you just push the right amount on the throttle, you get the right amount of response. Same on the brakes, same on the steering. Porsche's PDK twin clutch gearbox is so good these days that while you can get a manual 911, I would almost be tempted to say, you know what? No, this is such a sort of GT car on the road that it actually suits an auto really well. And it's so responsive on a circuit that only if you really want something else to do, and there are times when I would, should you really go for a manual. The balance is really nice these days. There is a little bit of sort of push onwards unless you trail the brakes into the corner to keep the nose planted, but that's unsurprising. The front is lightly loaded. And then if you want to lean on the back on the way out and exploit that rear engine traction, you can. If you want to give it a bung on the way in then it will do that on the way out. It's such a great car, it's such a great GT Sports Coupe track car. It's one of those cars that just does everything. Is it, however, preferable to the Corvette? Well, I think they do the same thing in slightly different ways. That Corvette engine is really got loads of character and its intrinsic character on a circuit certainly is really playful really willing it feels a proper sports car i really liked it really like its balance really like its body control really like the interaction i wouldn't want to say it's better than a 911 but i also want to, wouldn't want to say that it's worse than a 911 it's just a very different car i would not blame you if you thought you know what i really want one of those mid-engine corvettes and if you don't well i don't think you'd be too unhappy with a 911 but what i can say is that 
the expensive sports coupe market for powerful, engaging cars has seldom looked more competitive.